It's a great time to be in California if you believe in clean energy. Uh, over the f last five years, I've been watching all my neighbors slowly, one by one, started putting solar panels on their roof, and now they all start, started buying electric cars. So it's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> the problem is we all go home, sun's going down, we plug our cars in, and then what happens? Um, so Sila has been thinking about problems like that for, for the last, more than the last 10 years. Originally at LBL and then Google and then last several years at Slack, and she has a vision how we can manage all of that and stay still 100% clean. Sheila. Uh, well, uh, I started by saying welcome. Uh, did you hear that? Okay, good. Um, so I uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, the motivation behind transitioning to clean energy today. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, how the electricity grid works today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we're transitioning the electricity grid. And then particularly, I want to focus on some of the issues with the transmission system, the distribution system, and the consumer side technologies. And I want to talk a little bit about what our team, Gizmo, Grid Integration Systems and Mobility, uh, is doing in this, in this area. So whenever I say Gizmo, you should clap or something. My entire team is in the back with their t-shirts. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. All right, so um, during this sort of hour, I also want to take you from my home country, Turkey, to our lab in Building 27 as well. So let me start with um, a little bit about me. I uh, grew up in Istanbul in Turkey. I was a terrible student in elementary school, first grade especially, so I had to change schools because I did, couldn't learn how to read and write. Um, so my parents took me to this other school and I actually had um, a really fun time. The first couple of days I would escape from the classroom and start playing with water in the, in the bathroom. And one day the teacher actually followed me and um, came to the bathroom and said, listen, I understand you don't want to be in the classroom, but..." Earth's resources are limited, and I don't like you wasting water. And instead, please come to the classroom. We can talk about other activities that you can do. So of all the things in elementary school that really stuck with, stuck with me all these years, and it really shaped me in terms of the way I look at energy, um, not just water, energy, and really drove me in the path of efficiency and conservation. Um, so. That brings me to my next slide, which is this picture of the Earth that I really, really like. And when people look at it the first time, they always look at these bright spots. But today I want you to concentrate on the dark spots, because there are over one billion people who do not have access to electricity. And those are the kind of people that we need to bring up. We need to make sure that they have access to electricity. But we need to do it in a very thoughtful, very sustainable way not the same way that we have been um, using our resources over the last 100 years. So another picture of the Earth, because I really like it. And this time I want to talk a little bit about climate change. And of course, climate change is the observed um, changes in the century, um, century uh, scale rise in the Earth's temperature and uh, its related effects uh, in general. And this number. Uh, and I do have a clicker, so I'll use that. Um, this number, plus two degrees Celsius, is a very important number. It's the limit in the change of the average temperature um, increase from the, compared to the pre-industrial levels. So a lot of people talk about this, this number, and it is an important number. But for me, it's a very difficult number to sort of wrap my arms around and start thinking doing something about it. So instead, I focus on these two numbers, 300 parts per million. This is the concentration of uh, a limit, uh, concentration of uh, CO2 in the at atmosphere. And then 500 parts per million is another um, limit, uh, 350 being the lower limit, 350 being the upper limit. And today, we're somewhere around 410. OK, maybe not. Uh, today, we're somewhere around 410. This number is important because if you think about 350 parts per million as a healthy person, let's not talk about what 550 gets you, but 410 is someone who went to the doctor and the doctor said, you're overweight, you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, you need to quit smoking, and you need to lose weight. 
So that's where we are as a planet today. We need to do something about it, and we need to do something about it soon. So here are sort of the CO2 con contributions um, in the greenhouse mix. Uh, globally, carbon dioxide uh, contributes 65% to greenhouse gas emissions. And in the US, it's, the number is more like 81%. So these numbers are huge. Tackling this, this uh, gas is an important first uh, step for us. The second thing is that we at Gizmo are really focusing on buildings, electricity grid, and transportation. So when you look at those uh, uh, things like the electric, I can't, okay. Um, so when you look at the combination of electricity, transportation, and uh, buildings globally, we have about 45% of the global um, greenhouse gas emissions. In the US, this number is much larger, uh, close to 67%. So in our research, we're trying to tackle um, a large portion of the problem that we hope. So let me talk a little bit about electricity grid. Our electricity grid is designed to run one way. The power flows one way. Uh, generators generate. They use uh, different resources. They burn them uh, and, and uh, generate electricity. Um, this electricity is transferred over um, high voltage, uh, long lines over to distribution centers. Distribution substations eventually uh, step this uh, electricity down to where the buildings can consume. So, again, all right, I think I turned it on this time. Um, so, um, transmission lines, high voltage, long distances, and then eventually we get the, the voltages in our homes, 120 to 140 volts. Now, for a distribution system operator, the voltages at the grid edge is important because um, that's how they actually manage the electricity grid. They care about these voltages because our appliances are, um, you know, uh, things that run in our homes really are sensitive to, to these voltages. About a 5% plus and minus change uh, is, is okay, but anything beyond that could be detrimental to some of the appliances that we have. Um, and overall, the system runs on 60 hertz, or actually in the US, it runs on 60 hertz. In, um, in, the, in Europe, it's 50 hertz. In Japan, it's 60 and 50 hertz, depending on where you are. This frequency of the system is an important metric because when the transmission system operators are looking at the grid and running the grid, they really look at this number and gauge what the supply and demand balance is like. So if, the, if it drops, there's definitely a problem with the system, whether there's a generation that's down, or loads that are up, or a combination of things. So this number is extremely important for grid operators. So let me just tell you the four basic rules in, in, in the electricity grid. The first one, well, I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. How about that? That will keep you awake. Um, the system must maintain voltage within acceptable limits, and that's the 5% plus and minus at the grid edge. That's what I was talking about. The system must pay, uh, maintain steady state, a steady frequency. That's the 60 hertz I was talking about. The uh, system must be able to address variability and uncertainty. Now, our system, this system, is designed such that generators generate so that if I flip a switch, that um, I can have electricity where I am. So that's sort of the variability and uncertainty that we need to think about when we're, um, when we're thinking about running the grid. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, I'll come back to this issue because renewables add much more variability and uncertainty to the electricity grid, causing huge problems. But we're talking about the grid as it was, uh, and, and again, variability and uncertainty are big portions of the risk management. Then the generation transmission must be able to meet peak demand. Um, that's a big, big problem because um, let me just show you, illustrate this a little bit. This is a um, graph called um, load duration graph. And this is the real data from the California system between September 5, 2005 and September 2006. Sorry, it's a little blurry, but let me try to explain it. On this uh, axis, we have the hours of the year, 1 to 8760. Uh, and then on this side, we have the uh, magnitude of the peak. So for each hour, we plot the magnitude of the peak, and then we order them. 
So um, here that year, we had a new peak in California, over 50 uh, gigawatts of peak. Um, but, but we had all of these resources, about 10% of the resources ready to go, just so we can main, uh, meet the needs of this peak. And that peak only occurred uh, 60 hours, less than 60 hours that year. So building for peak capacity is important because that's how we maintain re reliability of the system. But it's also important that if we can cut down this peak, that our system can be much more efficient and effective. So that's something to think about going forward. I'll, I'll go back to the variability and peak issues um, in the next few slides. Um, I wanted to give you this uh, actually URL in the bottom um, because it's a great place to look at and visualize the electri uh, US electricity grid. And also I pulled this, uh, this visualization just to show you that the US grid is made up of three interconnections, the Western interconnect in uh, green, the Eastern interconnection, uh, that's in pink, and uh, uh, Texas in, in yellow, ERCOT is the region. Uh, that's in yellow. And each of these regions are little bow ties here, are interconnections. Um, they're connected, interconnected to, to each other. So if there's a problem in one interconnection, we can isolate that whole interconnection so that it doesn't affect the rest of the electricity grid in the US. And this uh, slide also, this picture also shows the transmission um, systems that are already there and the size of those transmission systems, but also the planned transmission of the, uh, of the electricity grid in the US. So I really recommend that you go to infrastructureusa.org and uh, take a look at some other visualizations that are very, very interesting uh, for the, uh, you describing the electricity grid. Okay, so that was the grid as we know. Our grid is changing right now. Um, Part of it is driven by these re renewable portfolio standards that are adopted in 29 states. So we may be outside, the federal government may be outside of some of the um, accords and thinking, but the states continue to maintain their renewable portfolio standards and go ahead with their uh, renewable adoption goals. Um, the highest is uh, Hawaii with 100% renewables by 2045. And then, I don't know, maybe lowest is Pennsylvania with 85% by mm, 2020. Uh, I know that some cities in Pennsylvania have uh, renewed goals going all the way up to 50% by 2030. So even if the states may not have renewable portfolio standards or mandates, that there are some cities that are taking action into their own hands and making sure that they purchase their energy from clean uh, resources. So at the same time that we are adopting these renewable portfolio standards and having all these goals, we also look at the cost of, of these systems. So um, green is the cost of uh, wind. Uh, blue is the cost of solar. This is the increase in capacity of these uh, resources. And the price of uh, these resources are changing because part of it is because all these mandates and people are going and uh, purchasing more solar power and wind power. Um, but part of it is driven by other parts of the world where there is a lot of um, attention to clean energy adoption and there's a lot more production of solar units and wind units. Um, when we look at uh, natural gas and, and China coal, here's the actual uh, price points today. Um, actually, these are probably price points from a year ago. And then if we look at uh, US coal and nuclear, here are the price points. So when you think about solar and wind, the adoption is, it can be even cost justified going forward, not just um, something that we do for the good of the society and good of the earth, but really economically something that makes sense. Okay. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing on this slide. And that is, when you think about coal jobs, there are about 60,000, 70,000 coal jobs in the US. But the solar uh, industry has created 250,000 jobs. So not only does it make sense uh, in terms of uh, the cost of these systems, but it also makes sense in terms of uplifting our economy as well to invest in these clean energy technologies. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about what's happening in California. 
Uh, first, we had a million dollar, so, million solar, not million dollar, but million solar rooftops by 20, 2018 as one of the goals. We're, we're slowly getting there. Uh, we have 1.3 gigawatts of storage by 2020. And this is sort of distributed to, as a mandate to all of the utilities in California. Uh, PG&E has to have about 560 um, or somewhere around 600 uh, megawatts of storage, of which 85 uh, megawatts has to be in, on the consumer side, the others in distribution and uh, transmission systems. Same with uh, Southern California Edison. And uh, San, Diego's gas is, uh, San Diego gas and electrics goals are somewhere around 160 uh, uh, megawatts. So um, they're not only having these goals, but the PUC is making incentives available for folks to actually support transitioning to uh, storage devices. Now, storage is still expensive. We know that. So these in incentives really help um, uh, build a storage base that could help with the renewable adoption, especially with um, variability of renewables. Um, there's a 12 gigawatts of distributed um, generation uh, goal by 2020. Uh, we're on our way to achieve that, achieving that as well. Uh, we have a 5 million zero emission vehicles by 2030. Um, we have about, what, 300,000 electric vehicles today in California. So we have a long way to go on this one. And it's zero emission vehicles, not just electric vehicles. They, these could be um, hydrogen fuel cell cars and other uh, clean vehicles. And of course, uh, over the la last decade, we have installed 1.8 million meters, uh, smart meters. And what's so smart about them? Um, well, there are a couple of things, right? Someone doesn't have to go to your house to uh, read the meter. They can just roll a truck and read that meter. The other thing is that it can uh, capture data, uh, energy consumption data granularly. So it helps us to think about dynamic pricing and using dynamic pricing in the future. Um, the other thing is that it has an antenna that can communicate with the in-home devices. So you can pull really uh, fast uh, granular data from your smart meter almost up to five second data from your smart meter if you have the right equipment. And the right equipment is costing somewhere around $20 to $100 today. Um, you can plug it into your PC and grab real time data from your meter. Uh, we don't have a lot of tools um, that allow us to do something with that data, but we're working on it. Okay, so um, meeting California's 50% uh, clean energy goal by 2030 requires several pathways, several things that we need to explore and work on. Um, the first one, of course, uh, near and dear to my heart is efficiency and conservation. Um, there is a lot more we can do. We, we, as California, we've done really well in terms of efficiency and conservation, but we can do a lot more. Um, the other one is reducing the carbon in electricity produ production. So going to solar or wind and other resources that are um, available and low carbon. Um, another pathway that was identified is fuel switching. So today we have heating. A lot of our heating is with gas. We have a lot of cooking with gas. Uh, one of the um, sort of thinking is that if you switch your heating and cooking to electricity and then use electric clean energy resources for electricity production, then now you have a win-win situation. And then the final is reducing carbon content of the fuels that we utilize today. So those are sort of the pathways. Do I take questions now or later? I think you should always slow down, let everybody pass the question. Quick question, how efficient are the long lines in maintaining electricity? What's the loss? Oh, um, the transmission systems that carry high voltage is about 6%. Uh, HVDC is much more um, efficient, but let's, uh, park that and I'll get back to you. So our group is really t uh, focusing on these two pieces. How can we switch fuels and then how can we make our electric system cleaner? Okay, so here's how our grid is changing. We talked about this uh, grid for the last century. Uh, we're adding wind and solar at the transmission scale. These are really large scale, um, some distributed, some concentrated uh, wind and solar generation resources. We're adding wind, solar, and storage to our distribution system. 
uh, which is adding much more variability on the distribution system. And we're adding wind, solar, and storage in our homes. We all have uh, to deal with and sort through a lot of incentives today to figure out what is the right combination of things that we may want to put in our homes. And then, of course, we're uh, buying electric cars. So lots of choices for consumers today, lots of distributed new generation and new storage technologies, uh, and lots of variability of the system, which is a major problem. And in some cases, we're making the power flow uh, in the reverse direction, which can cause problems for the system. Um, the system has protection devices that chip off certain areas, uh, and by having the uh, power flow different direction, we could actually has, have some um, consequences. And on top of it, we're adding a lot of sensors to our system. We are adding, uh, we've added about 75 um, high uh, resolution sensors in our transmission system in California, about 300 in the whole Western interconnection region. We have added uh, really fast distribution system um, sensors. We've added smart meters. We have EV charging stations that monitor the EV charging. We have uh, some solar uh, generators that monitor solar. So there's a lot of more data that's coming out uh, from the system. And that means that we can actually use new techniques like data science and machine learning to better utilize these resources, to better plan and operate the electricity grid. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do in that space. OK, so imagine if we had more than 50% renewables and distributed energy resources today. Well, we actually had it a very short period of time. We had about 80% renewables. Um, well, the, uh, the, the small uh, line here says 67, because hydro, uh, does not count into our renewable portfolio standards. So only wind and solar uh, counts. Um, so 80% with hydro, we had some moments in California where we had all of that. But in the long run, it wasn't sustainable. We won't be able to operate the grid if we had it more than several hours. It would be detrimental. Um, we would have reliability issues, stability issues. We wouldn't know how to deal with these resources because we don't have markets that can take these resources at the uh, level that they're in. We uh, would have a lot of problems with security. We don't have really well-defined security of the distributed resources. So if we wanted to do it today for a prolonged time, we wouldn't be able to do it, um, unfortunately. So the solutions to uh, you know, taking all this 80% of the state's power from renewable resources lies uh, in the fact that we need to think about technologies and tools, but we need to think about policies and markets as well. Because technologies that we develop today need to find uh, value in the marketplace and they need to be supported by some of these policies. And here at Slack, we're working on technologies and tools. We're partnering with um, a university, um, Stanford University on the policies and market side and outsiders in California and outside of California on those, on the experts on, on these areas too. Okay. Um, so how can we minimize the cost of integration uh, when we have uh, more than 50% uh, renewables? Well, we have several options. I want to talk briefly about these options. Uh, the first one is um, having long distance high voltage DC lines where the transmission losses are small. Uh, but not many people want these transmission lines in their backyard. So it's expensive, the permitting is uh, long, and so we need to plan way ahead of time for these things to uh, be available. We can ramp natural gas and storage capacity. And as I mentioned earlier, storage is expensive and natural gas is not necessarily carbon free. So there are some issues with those two, but, but certainly, um, there are, there, there are an option, and there are an option for the transition for sure. And then we can use flexible load to follow generation. So this is probably one of the lower cost options, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. But the, the truth is we'll have to deal with a combination of the three. We can't just pick one and say that's what we're going to do. That's the only thing that we're going to do. Oh, and I had some pictures that didn't show up. Sorry about that. Um, 
So who here knows about the Stug curve? Yeah, I know you do. Um, OK, so if you don't take anything else from today's talk, please learn about the Stug curve. The Stug curve was developed by the California Independent System Operator. And it was developed in 2013. And here you have the megawatts. Oh, so it is designed or de developed, or it's the data from, uh, a March day in 2013. And they also plotted a March day in 2012. So it's a spring day where there's a lot of solar, but there isn't a lot of loads. There isn't a lot of air conditioning loads to take on that solar generation. So in 2012, uh, the system looked like that on that March day. Um, it had a little peak here, but peaked in the afternoon. In 2013, uh, this was the actual data. It peaked a little bit more in the, at the end of the day. And then from that, and with the goals that we have, and also um, uh, the models show the uh, penetration rates of these uh, solar, they said that these are the typical March days that we may expect going forward from 2013 to 2020. So that's why it's duck, called the duck curve. This is the belly of the duck. This is the head, and this is the tail. Um, they make it look like a duck. So, uh, but, but let me talk a little bit about what this, this signifies. This means that there's going to be some huge ramps in the morning and in the afternoon. And this also means that there's going to be a new peak in the middle, well, um, when there's no sun, and in the evening from 6 to 10. Uh, period. Now, when you, we think about our rates today, we still have rates that disincentivize folks for uh, using electricity here and incentivizes people to use electricity here. So our, our uh, rates and our system is not well aligned. And so we need to think about how we can get our policymakers and utilities move a little faster in terms of um, addressing uh, the problems of the uh, grid. Now, this was a projection that was done in 2013. Uh, in 2016, on, Feb on a February day, we actually saw this huge ramp. So even before 2020, we, we actually experienced, the California grid ex ex experienced this ramp. And then in, in 2016, in May, we actually sort of saw this really low um, load um, period uh, in, in, in May. So things that they have predicted that would happen in 2020 has already started happening in 2016. And we need to think about how our system can respond to these um, changes, uh, given the uh, impact of the renewables. OK, so this is actually a screenshot from the CalISO uh, portal. Uh, here is the sort of the URL for anyone who wants to take a look at it daily. You can go back to two months, I think. This was uh, on an April day. Uh, this shows the peak, expected peak. This is how much capacity we have on that day. Uh, actual peak is something like this. So we build another uh, 8 gigawatts, or, or we have uh, resources that are ready, spinning at 60 hertz, and some, and some not so much, um, waiting to be called in case there's a peak like that. So uh, not so efficient, necessarily. This is the system peak I was telling you about. And to, that happened in 2006 on a hot summer afternoon. Um, and this is the actual uh, consumption, and then the hourly, these faint lines are the hourly forecasts that the ISO makes uh, day ahead. So one of the things that we have been testing is this load flexibility. And I want to talk about how the loads can be flexible and what it means. And when we talk about loads being flexible, we think about automating them so that there's no human in the loop. And I'll talk a little bit about that. We think about shifting loads, shedding loads, and shaping loads. So I want to show you what, each of, what all the, each of these mean. So let's say this is a typical load profile of a Safeway or a Target. I don't know. Let's say Safeway. Uh, the peak is around 300 kilowatts. And this is the time of day uh, for the entire 24-hour period. And the peak happens around 6 or uh, 7 o'clock. Now, this nicely coincides with the duck curve. So I made this up so that it would. Um, but in terms of shifting, we would need to take this peak and move it to an earlier time or, if it, or, or a later time. 
In the case of a Safeway, it would probably mean that they would either pre-cool cool their facility, so really uh, sort of uh, change their set points down so that they can pre-cool the entire facility so that they could ride through that, uh, that period when it's very crowded. Or it could mean that they could buy a storage device and use that storage device. It could mean that there could be other thermal storage capability in the building, whether it's the product themselves, but they may, they may use those. So basically uh, shifting the load from a peak period to another uh, period, but using exactly the same energy, basically. Shedding is a little bit different because now we're not only um, saving energy, but we're also reducing the peak. So sh shedding, typical strategies is if you're operating your building at 72 degrees, uh, typically, you increase that set point to 74. Now your chillers back off, your fans back off, and so now you can actually save energy for a period of time. Now in the case of the Safeway, it could be a combination of things. I'm, this is a hypothetical Safeway. Um, it could be that uh, they have turned off their, um, uh, some of their equipment, some of their lighting, it could be some of the HVAC systems, it could be some of the cooling elements or anti-sweat heaters on their um, coolers. So it could be a bunch of things, but this is sort of what it looks like. Shedding is you reduce energy and you, you reduce your peak and you never recover that from that. And then shaping is really sort of setting a limit or you know, uh, thinking about uh, your peak and saying, I'm not going to exceed this level today and I'll do everything I can to make sure that I can maintain my building at that level. These, these strategies are important because uh, if we automate a bunch of buildings, not just single Safeway, and let's talk about all the Safeways in California, if we can automate their reaction to the duck curve, then we can actually deliver these services that could support um, some of the issues related to the duck curve. Let me talk a little bit about the um, automation. So whenever I talk about automating loads, automating buildings, people think, oh my god, no, the in, you know, utility is going to reach out into my building and control my things. And it's quite a different thing what I'm talking about is. Um, so the utility or the independent system operator publishes price or reliability information from the electricity grid. These are published on the internet in a machine readable format. So any computer can grab this information and bring it to the facility. In the facility, site A, site B, um, there is a building control system that has pre-programmed strategies. And this is very important because uh, these are strategies that are pre-programmed by the facility operator and brings the building into a low power mode. Uh, what I mean by that, that it automatically adjusts temperatures by two degrees. It could automatically uh, turn off some of the lights. It could um, do a bunch of things. But it is designed by the building operator and it's, uh, it's you know, programmed by the building operator. So no utility does anything to the building. All they want, all they do is provide these machine readable signals to the homes or the buildings and the buildings respond to those. I like automation, it's very dear to me because I spend about 10 years building this infrastructure. Um, and the reason for that is you can automate once and use it many, many times. So the only cost is the initial cost of automation and it's much less than some of the generation sources that we have today. The other piece of that is you can use it for short periods or longer periods. You can have a very flexible um, sort of calling of these events and, and reaction to those events. And then the nice, the third thing is that there's no human in the loop. So if the facility operator wants to take the day off, go play golfing, um, do something else, they can't. They don't need to be there to be able to trigger these events. And this is what a couple of buildings, like 25 of them, uh, that have participated in the automated event look like. So we stacked all of their loads on top of each other we have an event, uh, a reliability event starting at noon, and it continues until six. At three o'clock, um, the price of electricity goes five times. So uh, between noon and 3 p.m., they do one thing. They realize that the price has increased significantly. They do another shed and a deeper cut during that three hours. 
And at the end of the event period, some people go home, so the buildings don't even come up. Some continue to be on, but then go home at later times. Uh, but in general, this is sort of what a re, um, you know, an event looks like from a bunch of buildings. And this black line here is what the load would have been if there was no demand response event. And on this day, and this is an actual day, uh, we saved about two uh, megawatts of power from these 25 buildings, which is significant, uh, especially if they're co-located. For that distribution grid, it's a, it's a big, big, uh, significant impact. So let me talk a little bit. So that was sort of transmission, how the loads can participate in transmission, um, system operators, there's all sorts of policy implications, a lot of market implications, a lot of costs associated. I'm not covering any of those. But I want to talk a little bit about the problems with the distribution that we're, we are facing with all of these renewables on the system. So the, f okay. Um, so the first one that doesn't show up here is that um, there are more active devices on the, on the distribution network. We have inverters uh, that take uh, electricity that, uh, that is generated by solar uh, generation, converted into uh, alternating cor current that we can use, we have control over those inverters, but uh, we don't have very good models for uh, running um, the grid with these inverters. So lots of active devices that can be controllable that are not modeled appropriately. Um, the utility is unaware of small deployments. So you want to put solar and they, you do an interconnection uh, agreement with your utility. Utility takes that paperwork and nicely puts it in the drawer. None of the folks in the planning department or the operation de department really know uh, beyond you know, 10 kilowatts of uh, solar what people have in their homes. So, but if you have a lot of l less than 10 kilowatts of solar, it can add up to be a, a lot on a distribution network and can be disruptive. And, um, and so um, they'd like to know if there are customers uh, and keep track of those. And of course, the bi-directional power flow and over voltages are things that the utilities are concerned about and that these renewables at the grid edge could uh, potentially cause problems. So this is one device that is an active controller, which was in the first bullet point, but oh well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the utility being unaware and what we're doing in terms of providing them information about solar uh, in their territory from each uh, home. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the machine learning applications that we're doing so that we can actually detect uh, bi-directional power flows or over voltages on the system very quickly. Oh, now it comes. Um, so uh, one solution that we've been uh, developing, and my uh, colleagues in the room have been working on this for a while, is solar disaggregation. And it's using data science and machine learning to tell the utility which customers have solar, how much they're producing, and when. So in order to do that, we're using um, something called unsupervised uh, source separation algorithm, which is a mouthful, I know. Uh, but what it does is actually, this, if this is the net load we're seeing from uh, a smart meter, this is the actual consumption in the home, and this is the um, solar generation in the same home. So it takes that signal and divides it into what portion of it is load and what portion of it is generation. Um, in this home, we have about 7.5 uh, kilowatts of peak on this day. Um, and then we take that solar that we disaggregated and we compare it with the data that's actually on that home so we can see if our solar disaggregation algorithms are working properly. And in this case, the true solar, the measured solar is in the dark lines and the yellow lines show the disaggregated solar. Uh, so we're doing okay. In an individual home level, it's very difficult. This is a very difficult problem to solve. We're doing okay, but at the aggregate, we're doing um, considerab considerably much better. The other one I want to talk a little bit about is this um, detecting over voltages or detecting voltage deviations. Now, let me walk you through this. Uh, this is a very interesting thing to me, so I hope uh, you'll um, get to follow me as well. So this is a voltage, um, actual vo voltage readings at a given time. Um, and after this time, we'd like to know what the voltage is going to be so that if there's a deviation, if it's above a certain limit, we want to detect that and we want to make sure that we 
uh, fix that. But taking lots of voltage data and predicting voltages is a very difficult thing. And we can't typically do it because it depends on a lot of variables. And we can't possibly uh, predict that. What we can do, and we can do really well, is that we can take a power data or demand data from a home or from a neighborhood, and we can, do, we can forecast that demand data. And we have been doing this for a long time, and we can do this really, really well. What we've been working on is developing a learning mapping between the power and the voltage magnitude, so that if we can predict uh, power really well, then we can use the reverse mapping to generate voltage readings, and then detect this voltage um, violation. So I know it's a little bit um, uh, sort of difficult to think about, but it is actually in a very important piece uh, going forward for the distribution system planning and operations. And we're really excited to be uh, working on this problem and finding solutions that includes data science, includes machine learning. OK, so um, how am I doing in time? OK. Um, so let's talk a little bit about consumers. As consumers, we make decisions all the time. Um, we make daily energy efficiency uh, as a core uh, piece of our operations. We think about, you know, we have a lot of incentives. We think about replacing light bulbs. We think about using more efficient appliances. Uh, and we control, uh, better control our devices. And this is a daily activity, and the objective is to get as much um, service from each kWh uh, that we use, each kilowatt hour that we use, we want to get as much service as we can. When you think about time of use of energy, it's really about avoiding um, high electricity price periods and really consuming during times where there's, um, electricity is less expensive. And the wedge shows like the hours of engagement with the, with the grid. So we spend a lot of time on the energy efficiency, somewhat on the time of use, and probably less so on the inter increased interactions of the grid, those load shedding, um, shifting, and shaping type of activities. The, the important thing about that is that we need better measurement, more control, and, and we need to be able to meet multiple objectives. And let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, if you want to save electricity, if you, if you have a home today, if you want to save electricity, you can turn off your appliances. But the equation gets a little bit more complicated when now you have solar, you have electric vehicles, and you have storage. So now you have to manage a lot more things in, behind the same meter to maybe even get the same type of savings. On top of it, let's say you decide to provide grid services to the transmission system operator, this ramping service or whatever it may be. Uh, the objective space becomes even more complicated. So what we're doing at Stanford and Slack is to develop three pieces of technology to automate that decision making and to make sure that um, you can participate in any kind of a profitable market and uh, benefit from that transaction. So at the lower time scales, at the milliseconds to microseconds, we have a technology called smart dimming fuse. This is a fuse that sits in your panel, and what it does is very simple things. It turns on and off the entire circuit in your home, or it can change the voltage in that within those limits uh, to make sure that you can save uh, electricity power. Uh, at a higher level, at the minutes to uh, milliseconds level, we have a device called the Home Hub, and this Home Hub maintains the stability of the system, especially if you have solar and you know, um, storage and other things. And then its purpose is to collect all this data from your appliances and your smart meter and your smart dimming fuse and send it to the cloud coordinator. The cloud coordinator um, is a, a machine sitting somewhere uh, having some uh, control um, algorithms that are embedded in it. And it makes sure that you can share your resources optimally among these homes and also provide some grid services. So I will now show you a quick video and I will walk you through this, how these systems are supposed to work together. We actually uh, build this video before we actually uh, build the system uh, to just to get a sense of how it may work for us. So let me see. Uh, okay. So wait, let me stop. Uh, I told you I was going to take you to my lab, our lab. This is our lab. This is uh, the lab in building 27. And um, 
we're really excited to have the space to be able to experiment uh, at Slack. Okay. So this is a PowerNet demonstration. The objective is to build prin uh, the principle of connecting information networks to the power networks. Here is what the home hub um, interface looks like. And I'll stop this and talk a little bit. Oh. Um, in, in each of the homes, we have two set of lights. We have one storage device and we have one fan. Those sort of um, um, illustrative uh, loads in a, in a typical home. Uh, this is the interface for the cloud coordinator. And it shows what the price of electricity is, what's the current consumption of all of the homes, and some other fancy things. Now, um, let me, oh, no, I knew this was going to happen. Um, let me bring it here. Okay. Um, we have two sets of homes, uh, two sets of li lights for the economy home and a fan and a, a battery storage, two sets of lights and a battery storage and a fan for the comfort home. So this is our economy home and this is our comfort home. Yep, that's the comfort home. So let's look at the dynamic pricing scenario. Um, the electricity price goes from 3.3 3 cents to 3.1 cents. You could do. This is the what we see on the cloud coordinator. The lights in the economy mode. One of them turns off, and then the storage feeds um, the electricity back to these lights. So um, both lights are on, but one of them is fed through the storage device. This is what the drop in uh, electricity looks like. Um, let's say there's a loss of generation. Again, this is the economy home. Um, this is the cloud coordinator that says we have a loss of generation, notify the units. Each home gets this message that says loss of generation. Now we, our economy mode home uh, turns off a set of lights and then uh, uses these lights, uh, the, the storage to power this light and turns off the fan. In our comfort home, the lights are fed through the storage and one set of lights turn off. And in, the, in our cloud coordinator, we see um, the economy home going down and then there is a, also a, um, another a one that goes down as well, but you can't see it, it's too faint. So these are the goals of the project. Minimize information exchange, even though if we don't have any communication or very little communication, we want the system to operate we want to enable low-cost load control, so making sure that we can embed some of these controllers in our devices, increase consumer quality of service at the same time. So um, this is a project that is uh, funded by the California Energy Commission and the De Department of Energy, uh, ARPA-E program. Uh, we are partners with Stanford <coughs> University, uh, Google, and University of Florida. And we are going to be testing this in the Navy homes in San Diego. So a couple of um, other things that I want to talk about, but I'll skip this one. Uh, I'll take you to this one exciting project that we have <coughs> launched um, this year, last year. Um, and the, the, here is the, the, the um, goal of this project is to really think about if we can deploy artificial intelligence to improve grid resilience. Um, and we want to use machine learning and artificial intelligence for anticipating impact of weather events. We want to absorb grid events by virtual islanding, and that means the changing and controlling loads, uh, and recover fast from the outages. And here is a scenario that I want to sort of leave you with. Um, let's say we know all the tilt, location of the electricity poles and the tilt and direction of the uh, poles. And we know that there is going to be a heavy wind event coming up. There's going to be really strong winds tomorrow. We can identify those poles that have um, tilt and they could potentially be vulnerable to the heavy wind. We can actually simulate our system to figure out, well, where the vulnerabilities are, but also what the impact of those vulnerabilities are. And we can come up with recovery scenarios and we can automate this entire process so there's no human in the loop. So that's sort of what we're going to be doing in the next couple of years in this project, and we're very excited about it. Uh, our team uh, is about three years old. Um, our vision, collectively, we came up with is enabling 100% clean energy for all. 
Unlike other labs that are strong in power grids, buildings, and mobility, we're really focusing on the intersection of all of these areas. We want to look at vehicle to grid, vehicle to building, uh, you know, those kinds of uh, application areas where people haven't really spent a lot of time thinking. Here is our team. Uh, those with uh, black t-shirts on the back, uh, they're here to support me. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can certainly grab them and ask them questions too. Uh, we're lucky to have a very strong team and we get a lot of visitors, international visitors from Europe and other places. Uh, we work closely with Stanford uh, faculty and students and we also have a group of students who come here and work with us from Carnegie Mellon Silicon Valley campus every year in the fall. So we're lucky to have them. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. Silla, but before you guys ask questions, uh, we are webcasting this. So there is a button in the microphone in front of you. So please press it and then talk in the microphone. And once you are done, turn it off so somebody else can speak. So I guess you have a question. I think I used up part of my question with the, uh, the loss on the network. But if, if it's a little off topic, you can say no. But how vulnerable is the grid to sabotage? Uh, the grid is very vulnerable to sabotage. Um, there has been some sabotage attempts. Uh, we had people shooting uh, substations and making significant damage, uh, especially in pg and territory. We had several of them. Uh, we had people stealing copper from uh, some of these substations. Yeah, I mean, uh, our substations, our distribution network, um, not very safe. In terms of your duct curve, uh, if you go from 350,000 electric vehicles right now to 5 million, mm -hmm. factor 10 increase, how's that going to affect the duct curve at between 5 p.m. and 6 or 8 p.m. when everybody comes home and wants to charge their vehicle? Yes. And it's going to depend uh, to me in terms of efficiency of the vehicle, the uh, range of the vehicle, the typical commute distance, et cetera. So there's a lot of variables there that I think are going to be rather interesting to try to handle. So there's going to be a lot of incentives to uh, make sure that there's workplace charging uh, for those vehicles, that they can charge in the middle of the day in public charging stations and workplace charging areas. Um, again, the, um, right now, the incentives or disincentives are not well aligned. Uh, my, when I take my car home, I can charge it around 10 because that's where the uh, price of electricity go goes down. But in the future, the price of electricity is going to be really high during those peak periods to disincentivize uh, folks to charge during those times. So we need to make sure that our incentives are aligned with the technologies that we have. And unless we do that, there's going to be a big problem. You're right. Um, in, the, in the projections that you're making for the future for the state, are you, how do you uh, include the cost of making the panels, of mm -hmm. making the batteries, which are very intensive, intensive in terms of sure. use of energy? And of course, if you assume they're made in, in Nevada or in China, then you don't have to worry about California. Mm -hmm. But in the overall picture, this is pretty important. So I don't know if you're familiar with this new um, CEC decision that every home that's going to be built after a certain um, year is going to have to have a solar uh, panel on, on its roof. Um, I don't model these costs, so I depend on experts who uh, do these calculations. Um, and I can send you some papers that are available, uh, but I. I the, there the is a, a professor at Caltech mm -hmm. who wrote a, a number of papers about this, and he said that actually solar panels have a payback period in energy, mm -hmm. not in cost, in energy, of about four years. So if you install a, a solar panel on your house, for the first four years, you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 3.5 years, but it's mm -hmm. not one or two mm -hmm. years. 
Whereas in the case of wind, it's much better. But mm -hmm. you have to take into account this, the cost of the energy cost of making the device. Mm -hmm. And the batteries are much worse than the, solar, the panels. Mm -hmm. Embedded energy, you're right. Uh, there seems to be a, a lot of effort on putting individual installations in ho houses, which are very small scale, inefficient to install, not maintained by anybody with competence. Why are we not just building square miles of solar panels in the desert? Uh, we're doing that too. I think it's a combination. Uh, there's a lot of first cost for um, uh, those kinds of large installations. And well, so, no, actually, the cost per, per kilowatt hour is smaller. Yes, but when you think about the scale that you're building at, um, it's, and, and this is something that um, individual companies, uh, private uh, investment has to take on. Uh, the solar adoption in the homes is driven by individual um, household uh, owners or, uh, who are taking it upon themselves and they want to... Um, you know, install these systems on their roof. <laughs> yes, good. So it's good, not driven good for by them. anything <laughs> but, uh, but sort of the will to um, participate in green energy transition. Yes, but the nice people, but they're being subsidized by tax uh, credits, which don't apparently go to the utility company. Um, so I'm missing the point here. Um, you talked about security uh, with your shape shifting internet connections and such. What about uh, uh, the other kind of sabotage? Yeah, so um, when we were developing this automation system, we looked at um, security really, really hard. We're using the same kind of security that you use in your bank transactions. So if people are willing to and can get into your bank, bank transactions through the connectivity options, they can get into your um, home um, management, not home management system, but um, this, this load shedding system. What they can send is nothing more than a signal that your system can understand and act upon. Um, and of course, at a large scale, they could be detrimental to the grid as well. Uh, but, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of attacks in these demand response systems today. I think they still think that attacking banks is a more uh, profitable, uh, so, you know, breach. With uh, California's new mandate to install solar panels on new uh, buildings, do you think that's being done in a responsible way that's well thought out, or um, is there some some like vulnerability uh, associated with that? I didn't get the question. Can you? Oh. Sorry. Uh, with the new mandate to install solar panels on, on buildings, um, is that being done in a well thought out way or is it more ad hoc or can you talk about some of the challenges that that proposes? Yeah, so um, it's so new that I actually haven't looked at the details. Um, uh, there's going to be a lot of controversy around uh, this topic. Um, the, there are some assumptions that were made in making this decision. And I haven't even looked at those assumptions yet, unfortunately. This is maybe a couple of weeks old. Um, so let's talk in a couple of weeks after I've gone through it. Um, at one time, there was a, I don't know whether to call it a, a plan or um, a lot of optimism about using banks of electric cars during the day to actually feed power back. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, so you mentioned several parameters of storage in there. I don't know if you were including uh, that idea and that storage, and, and where is that proposal or idea or wishful thinking yeah, so now? I have done one of the first um, vehicle-to-grid demonstration projects in California with, at the LA Airport Space um, uh, in Southern California. There we have seen a lot of issues with vehicle-to-grid integration. First, uh, it was extremely costly to get these resources into the market then it was really costly to have bi-directional charging stations. Then it was a lot of problems in terms of power quality issues that these bi-directional inverters were causing at the uh, facility. Then we realized that there isn't a lot of money because the expectation was that 
each of the cars would uh, receive around $200 per month and could make up for the, um, uh, for the lease, uh, for their lease. But at the end, these cars made uh, a, a portion, a very small portion of these expected uh, um, savings or opportunities. So uh, we, we looked at it. There were a lot of issues. Maybe it was before its time. Uh, but currently, we don't have a lot of uh, value in the marketplace to be able to do that. And it's costly to participate and costly to run these systems. So the smart meters, the, they emit a wireless signal, I presume. And is there a public API for how to communicate with them? Yeah, so um, there is a public API. You have to ask your, I think they have turned all of the uh, antennas, but um, if you can't catch the signal, um, you can uh, ask your um, utility to turn the antenna on. Uh, it is a, there is a public API. You can pull data using green button um, and green button connect options. Um, and, and yeah, you can have access to your own electricity data at much more granular. What's the, what's the uh, current state of the art for uh, utility scale storage? Oh, good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know current state of the art. I know that there are a lot of companies that have different types of chemistries uh, that have been um, uh, playing in that area, that have been doing installations with utilities. Uh, there are flow batteries, there are lithium ion batteries, there are lead acid ba batteries. There's sort of a lot of combinations um, of these systems. So I'm not really sure. Maybe someone else can. Uh, only about a year ago, oh. uh, we had a public lecture talking on batteries. Uh, Yeshue was the person from Stanford University who talked about it and talked about batteries on all scales, including grid integration, uh, grid storage batteries. Uh, you could probably go to our website and look for our past public lectures and pick one of that up. Uh, maybe that's a good place to start. Uh, here. So can you talk about, uh, about the life cycle of each uh, different re renewable energy technologies? Like uh, how long do you need to replace your solar panel when, when it becomes like really ineffective? and batteries, and I guess the wing will be long-lasting, but I'm not sure. So the problem with these technologies is that everyone claims that their um, system uh, can, can go 25 to 30 years. The problem is that some of these battery chemistries, some of these batteries um, haven't been around that long. So while there's a lot of um, sort of uh, claim that these, the lifespan of these technologies can, can be long, we haven't really had these technologies in long enough times to sort of really understand their lifetimes. Um, so uh, we'll wait and see, I guess. Uh, do you have any information on uh, the problem that appears to be happening is uh, we're going to more efficient equipment, which is constant power, mm -hmm. the lighting and the computer's always been that way. And the grid relies on Loads, basically, if you lower the voltage, they draw a little less power, but actually uh, now they draw more current. Yep. Um, is, is there any work being done on that? Yeah, so the smart dimming fuse that we're working on is actually looking at uh, extracting. You sound like a technical person, so I'll go a little bit technical. Um, uh, it, it extracts the IV curves for each of the sub-circuits. And then uh, when you have that, you can actually determine if changing voltage is going to save you any energy. If you have inductive loads, um, that may not be the case. If you have resistive loads, you can actually, by changing the voltage, you can save energy. Now, if I had to choose between energy efficiency, LEDs versus controllable, um, I don't know, uh, incandescent light bulbs, I'll take LEDs, low consumption, energy efficiency, every day, always. Uh, and then think about um, variable resources, load flexibility with other types of uh, things. But for me, energy efficiency is always first. Flexible load come second. Um, only uh, could you actually start thinking about 
um, um, making kind of uh, any um, um, sort of giveaways from energy efficiency if there is any uh, value um, that the consumer can extract from other things and can help with um, taking on uh, low-cost clean technologies, right? That's the only time that I would say maybe we want to think about, rethink this. If, if it can operate on clean energy, low-cost clean energy, maybe we want to take that energy on and help the grids in some days. But overall, energy efficiency always first. Last question. Yeah, uh, do you guys take into consideration the reactive power mm -hmm. for the inductive and capacitive loads in uh, controlling the overload uh, situations and peaks? Yeah, so I didn't go there. Um, I didn't go uh, explaining and talking about the reactive power, but the new inverter technologies and electricity rule 21 that was passed uh, really pays attention to control of the reactive power too. These inverters have capabilities, not only control the volts, but also bars, the reactive power component of the system. So it is a big uh, issue, react, de you know, dealing with reactive power is a big issue. And these new technologies are uh, positioning themselves in a way that we would be able to handle some of the reactive power issues as well. You're right. Well, thank you. Uh, how about we thank Stila and then maybe she'll be here for a few minutes and our Gizmo team will be around too and you guys can all ask them questions.